morning, everyone. I'm Senator Savino. This is the Managing Committee of the New York State Senate. I am joined by the Ranking Committee member to my right, Senator Jesse Hamilton. Uh, Senator Farley, the Vice Chair, why don't you come sit next to me on the left. Uh, we are also joined by Senator James Sanders, Senator Fred Akshar, Senator uh, Jack Martins, and I believe Ms. O'Neill, we do have a car, do a car. So we have some bills on the agenda, but first we have a very important uh, task before this committee. We are going to take up the nomination of Maria Rulo, the new superintendent. She's been the acting superintendent of the Department of Financial Services. And she's coming before the Senate Banking Committee. She will be appearing after us at the Senate Insurance Committee and hopefully at some point this week before the Finance Committee and then before the full Senate for full confirmation. So we thank you for appearing before us. Uh, at this point in time, does any other member have any more comments before the floor, or do we want to hear from her first? We want to hear from her first. So at this point, we'd uh, like you to introduce yourself, tell us about yourself, and then members will probably have some questions for you. Sure. Good morning, Senators, and uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, Senator Savino, Vice Chair, Senator Farley, Ranking Member Senator Hamilton, and the other members of the Banking Committee. It is my pleasure to appear before you today, and it is a great honor to be nominated by Governor Cuomo to serve the people of New York as Superintendent of the Department of Financial Services. I also want to recognize my children, Christopher and Maya, who are sitting behind me here today and some members of my terrific staff. I look forward to working with the legislature and getting to know you all over time. As I sit here today, while I've met with and spoken with some of you, I recognize that you don't know a lot about me, so I wanted to tell you a little bit about myself today. I am a lawyer, a mother, and a lifelong New Yorker. I was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, the youngest of five children. My parents raised during the Great Depression, who themselves were children of immigrants. I was raised every day to believe in the American dream. My father was a decorated World War II veteran who suffered serious war injuries and became a factory worker following the war. My mother was a homemaker who desired for her children what she was unable to do herself, get a college and maybe even a graduate degree. My parents' encouragement never wavered, even when I made what must have seemed to them at the time an incredible decision not only to go to college, but to law school the first person in my extended family to do so. After attending public elementary school, I attended high school at Fompon Hall Academy in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, and earned my bachelor's degree at the College of Mount St. Vincent in the Bronx. I put myself through college and law school, working whenever I could during school and school breaks. I earned my law degree at New York University School of Law, and later a master's in public administration from NYU's graduate school, Wagner School of Public Service, as public service has always been a calling. I am here before you today because I am dedicated to the public's interest, and I appreciate the good fortunes that life has bestowed on me. My career has been more than I could have ever dreamed of. I, it has been incredibly fulfilling, with much more still to do. My first experience in public service was clerking for a federal judge in Norfolk, Virginia. After my clerkship ended, I returned home to New York and took a job at a law firm that then and now was considered at the top of the profession for corporate litigation, Paul Weiss, Wifkin, Wharton, and Garrison. I spent 27 years at Paul Weiss, becoming a partner after seven, the second woman litigation partner in the firm's history. I handled a broad range of commercial matters in the trial and appellate courts, as well as proceedings before federal and state governmental agencies, including DFS. I took on leadership roles at the firm and externally in the profession. I am a trial lawyer, an appellate advocate, and a client counselor. Most importantly, I am very practical. I believe in compromise to get things done for the good of everyone. I am prepared, careful, and thoughtful in my approach to solving problems. I do not shy away from hard issues, a good debate, or assuming the role of decision maker. Throughout my career, I have always committed myself to the public interest. I diaried thousands of hours to pro bono, nonprofit, and bar association activities. I served on numerous boards and held many leadership roles. 
I represented individuals and small businesses in all levels of the court system pro bono, and I taught and mentored young lawyers to do the same. I have championed equality for women and human rights for all. I believe that in life, having an impact means helping another person, even in the smallest way, to have a better life or even just a better day. I was privileged to serve as Executive Deputy, Deputy Attorney General for Economic Justice under then Attorney General Andrew Cuomo. While at the AG's office, I headed the Economic Justice Division, overseeing the bureaus of investor protection, antitrust, real estate finance, consumer fraud, and the internet. There I handled many matters involving the banking and insurance industries, as I had in private practice. I believe that my combined experiences in both the private and public sectors on both sides of the table have given me a well-rounded and in-depth view of not only our legal system, but also our financial markets and financial institutions. Should I be privileged to be confirmed as DFS superintendent, my overarching goal will be to maintain and strengthen New York's status as the financial capital of the world. I will work to implement DFS's mission to ensure we not only keep pace with, but lead the rapid and dynamic evolution of the financial services industries, guarding against financial crises and protecting <coughs> consumers and markets from fraud. I want to look at the banking industry holistically and address the needs of New Yorkers who are currently not being served in their financial needs. It is clear to me that as DFS superintendent, my foremost obligation to New Yorkers will be to ensure the strength of the financial markets and institutions that are crucial to maintaining New York's vibrant economy and doing so with a true sense of fairness necessary to earn the trust and confidence of all stakeholders. The financial industry is a vital part of New York's economy. We must applaud its successes. We also must be vigilant in ensuring appropriate fiscal and legal oversight because our institutions must also follow the law. I believe it is imperative that DFS protect the public from overly risky decision making and the absence of adequate internal controls. As a regulator, DFS at times will need to enforce the law against the few who seek to evade it. When that happens, I will make sure that we have both our facts and our law right and that we listen to all sides. I am both pro-business and pro-consumer. I do not believe these terms are mutually exclusive. I believe that everyone, from industry to citizenry, benefits when the rules are followed by everyone. Since becoming acting superintendent three and a half months ago, I have been getting an up-close and personal look at the agency's work, efficiency, and functionality. Its current efforts within existing structures, as well as its challenges and many opportunities. I have begun to fill some key vacant positions, some of whom are with me here today, and will continue to do my best to ensure that DFS runs on time and does the work that it was mandated to do. I will build on the agency's many successes. Where there is room to improve, and there always is room for improvement, I will work hard to make the necessary improvements. Great work has already been done and continues to be done every day by the immensely talented people at all levels of DFS. Their commitment is inspiring, and I am privileged to have the opportunity to lead them forward. As you know, DFS has been in existence for five years. In that remarkably short span of time, two existing agencies merged and were restructured, yet continue to provide vital services to the public without interruption. I seek to further merge the agency's functions going forward to make it even more efficient and even more effective. I will focus on DFS's core activities, supervision of the financial sector, fair and effective investigation of fraud, protecting the interests of New Yorkers from predatory and unfair practices, and advancing industry innovation. I will work to support increased consumer access to banking services while ensuring compliance with existing laws and regulations, and where necessary, promulgate new regulations and support new laws in order to best adapt with current needs and times 
and most importantly, the needs of the people of this great state. I look forward to working with you, the legislature, as a partner in both your oversight and legislative roles. When you call me, I will answer. When you write to me, I will respond. I believe firmly that open channels of communication between us are good for the people of New York. In closing, I would like to say again, I am immensely honored by this opportunity to serve the people of this great state as superintendent of DFS. I am acutely aware of the many ways the work of the Department of Financial Services impacts the daily lives of New Yorkers. I take that responsibility very seriously, and if confirmed, I will faithfully execute my duties in service to the people of New York State. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you. We have since been joined by Senator Terry Murphy and Senator Ken Parker. Uh, I'm sure many of the members have questions. Seth, I'll only ask one or two and then turn it over to the members. You, your predecessor is somewhat legendary, uh, started the agency. He has somewhat of a reputation as a crusader. Uh, you either loved him or you hated him, depending on where you are in the financial industry. So I'm curious how you see your role as the head of DFS. Continue the Crusader role that Ben Lossby had, uh, the new sheriff of Wall Street, or are you more, I heard you say, a more pragmatic approach? How do you see your role as the superintendent of DFS? Uh, I don't wear boots, so on the sheriff's side. Um, I, um, I am me. Uh, when people ask, I've been asked this question a number of times to say, who are you going to be? I'm going to be Maria Vulo. And what I've said to you is uh, what my career path has been. Uh, my, you know, I've, I've been a lawyer for over 27 years. Uh, I have represented uh, clients over those years. I have always exercised independent judgment. Uh, I have always uh, done so with integrity. My reputation is the most important thing to me. Uh, and I see myself as operating within the mandate that has been given to me as DFS superintendent by the legislature, and I will act within that mandate. So I wouldn't want to label what that is, except to say what I've said in my opening statement. I believe in, you know, my, New York is the financial capital of the world. I'm a lifelong New Yorker. That is, I am proud of that, and I want to see that grow. I want to see more jobs in New York. I also want the financial services sector to serve the needs of all New Yorkers across the state. Uh, and I want to tackle, so I think you might see uh, creative, innovated, uh, innovative initiatives to try to address those concerns. At the same time, I think you will see and it is my intention and vision to make sure that DFS not only runs on time, but runs more quickly, that it addresses all of the stakeholders, and that we make sure that we are fiscally conservative in protecting the markets from, you know, risky decisions. And that's my main objective, and, and frankly, my main obligation is the oversight of the financial markets in New York State. Thank you. When we met, we talked about some of the issues that are before you now and have been for a while. Uh, and I'm glad to hear you reiterate your commitment to consumer protection. Some Absolutely. of the issues that have been, you know, New York has been struggling with are still present, whether it's the foreclosure prevention issues, uh, the, the new zombie property problem, uh, which is a whole new wrinkle in that. Subprime lending in the auto industry is another way that uh, we've driven the bad actors out of the mortgage industry and it does repurpose classify themselves as, you know, subprime lenders in the auto industry. Debt buyers, uh, the department has implemented regulations uh, in conjunction with OCA to deal with the issue of debt buyers. This is the last question I'll ask you before I turn it over. Can you tell us a bit of the success of that? Because there's still a, a concern that we need to legislate that, to codify it into law. Because it's great to have the regulation, but law is always better. Can you give us a brief Update on what's happening with debt buyers. Well, on the broader question, as you noted, Senator, on um, the 
I would call it the sort of predatory practices in the lending industry and DFS, you know, payday lending is illegal in New York. DFS has been and DFS has been vigilant in the three months I've been there. We have uh, entered into consent orders with two other payday lenders and a lead generator. Uh, the auto lending, I mean, uh, part of my responsibility at DFS is not just to look at the individual financial institutions in silos, but to look at trends across the financial institutions and see where there might be overly risky practices. And the subprime mortgage crisis that caused the 2008 Great Recession, I hope this doesn't happen, but can replicate, it's replicated issues there, but we are looking deeply at that. We are looking at online lenders who are not even licensed by us and should be licensed by us because what they are doing is basically <laughs> substituting for what would be a payday lender and we have written to all the ones that we know of and said, explain to us why you don't need a license. So, and, and what these, uh, Lending Club is one, there are others. What these enterprises then do is they have these small dollar loans and then they package them and then they sell them to investors. And what does that sound like? That, you know, history repeating itself. So we are looking very carefully at that. At the same time, and so that's the debt buyers, at the same time, we have to provide the services in the more, what I would call traditional banking industries to our New Yorkers who are being taken advantage of by these other enterprises. And that's where I think that my background and relationships and experience and working with industry could perhaps move that forward. It's not a small task, but we can't simply go after all of this. We have to serve the needs of the people who need the small loans, who need, you know, but we, we can't have it be a spiraling debt cycle that actually makes them worse off. And so I think looking at that whole problem holistically, not just attacking this, but saying, what, what's the solution for the people who are not being served here but need service somewhere? So I hope that. Thank you. Senator Carlin. Uh, thank you. Uh, Madam Superintendent, let me uh, start with the fact that I've been on this committee for 40 years and I've chaired it for close to 30 years. I, I'm very impressed with our current chairman, how she's uh, addressed so many of these arcane uh, issues and so forth. But it has dramatically changed in New York State, the banking the situation. The feds have eaten their lunch on many things. And uh, uh, I, I, one thing you did not mention that I would want you to make a priority is protecting and encouraging the state State's charter. charter. Uh, otherwise, we might as well just shut the doors. Uh, another thing that I want to address that uh, maybe even complain about I don't even have a check casher in my district. Uh, now, believe it or not, they service the core areas, the tenderloin areas and so forth, and provide the only financial services that is possible in those areas. Now, uh, the chairman has a bill on today that's being attacked and so forth by a lot of well-meaning people, but they're actually hurting uh, because your department, to uh, be fr very frank with you, has really not, has not done very much to protect in, in, uh, the check cashing industry. Uh, because the whole nature of check cashing is going down, there's no less checks and so forth. So unless they can expand their, uh, uh, their area of expertise and, and, and consumerism, there will not be any financial services in these very, very poor areas because I'll tell you right now, banks, credit unions, they don't go there. And the people that, that, uh, that these check cashers serve, uh, the check cashers know their customers and uh, are able to help them. And uh, otherwise, you're talking about loan sharks being uh, in 
enhanced and many other things. And uh, I think that's something that your department has to look at a little bit more thoroughly, and they have not. And uh, in many areas, I, I appreciate what you're trying to do, but I do want to go back, because it wasn't mentioned, the state charter is terribly important, or otherwise we're going to be out of business. And that there's been a dramatic change in this uh, we are still the financial center of, of the world, in my judgment, and uh, I'd like to see us maintain that. Thank you, Senator. I'm glad you mentioned the state charter. Um, I am a huge proponent, as I said, of New York and obviously of the state charter. Uh, I actually hosted last week my first state charter advisory board. Uh, meeting, um, which is part of the statute that created DFS, and I know that there's a bill pending to extend that because that, that board expires in October, um, and there's membership on that board from the various sectors. Uh, I want to encourage the state charter. I will say that the statistics that I was given indicates that since DFS was formed, we've actually increased uh, by five. Uh, you know, the, the number of state charters, we need to do better, uh, the, you know, and we need to do better uh, on the credit union side. Uh, the banking side, we have, uh, you know, some large banks that are New York State chartered. They still are also regulated by the FDIC because of the deposits. Um, many of the large national banks go to federal charter, the OCC instead. Uh, but we um, would love to have more. But I think we, you know, we have a great number of New York community banks, uh, you know, across the state. I have met with uh, the CEOs and the leaders of a number of them, and I will continue to do that. I want to encourage their work. Uh, I've met with the check, um, the um, credit union association. On the check cashers, I recognize that there's a pending bill. Uh, we are looking at this issue. I am looking at this issue very seriously. Uh, the job, in my view, of DFS is to balance the consumer needs with ensuring that the, the individuals who are in charge of the financial institutions can actually do the services that they would be authorized to do, so that they can be lenders and have the adequate capital and have the adequate uh, systems in place to protect personal data, for example, uh, and just, you know, so, but, but I'm certainly open-minded about that, and whatever we can do to service uh, the underserved communities, I'm looking at uh, more deeply, you know, the business development districts, because we do have a way through that program uh, to provide incentives to financial institutions to come into certain communities because the profitability is not there for them on the sort of smaller dollars, but the business development districts or similar programs which then provide for the municipal deposits, which gives them that you know, revenue stream of municipal deposits is another way to maybe encourage more institutions in the underserved communities. But I can just tell you that, and I think we have to combine all of that with education, financial literacy, you know, protecting against abuse, I mean, all of that, and I would like to look at it holistically. It will take some time, but I'm keenly focused on this issue. I think it's critically important.
So here we can pick up line by doing business. Uh, we have a lot of red lining going on. So how, how do you see red line in DFS? It's kind of trying to, to uh, climb down the federal members and also red line. Uh, these yes. are cases that both been approved. Uh, so on the, um, one of the consent orders that uh, was done under my leadership a few months ago on the payday lending required them to give the money back to the people. So that was the first time that that was done. You know, that's not always easy to do, but I will tell you that that if, if there, and this is broad based, if there's a consumer predatory practice and consumers are injured, first thing is how do we get the money back to them? Because they're the ones that are injured. You know, if you get a penalty as well, you get a penalty as well, but that's, you know, getting the money back. So I am, uh, and, and we did that, as I said, it was uh, six weeks to, to, to two months ago. Uh, I'm one of those payday lenders requiring them to, to pay the money back to the people. Um, on the redlining, um, we do um, consumer examinations of our um, lenders. Uh, in the mortgage banking area in particular, there are some concerns uh, on this, uh, and we are looking at that. Um, I can tell you that there's some work in progress on that, and we are looking at how we can establish a process across the industry to examine redlining and what the protocols would be with that. I actually have a memo on my desk on this issue. So um, I, and I, I, I see what's going on. I care deeply about this and we will, we will take appropriate action on that. You spoke earlier, uh, about the oil industry being bundling uh, loans. Yes. Uh, the shadow banking not coming to the issue. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure the jurisdiction controlling bundling of mortgages and loans, uh, but what can be done uh, through the interest to make sure the amount of financial meltdown to the shadow uh, So on the auto lending side, we do regulate the sort of credit, you know, the, the lenders, um, and we're looking at this very carefully, and there are some currently under our watch on this issue. Um, in the auto industry, some of the behavior that is problematic is not necessarily, although we're looking at it, within the actual lending, but rather at the dealer level. And many of the manufacturers have different legal entities for the different uh, pieces of it. And so, for example, if the, and I think Senator Savino, this was at, at, at a hearing before you, which I've briefed myself on, is that there's um, uh, the conduct in one and then it just goes to the separate legal entity, which is the credit entity, uh, and may not be the one responsible for it. But, you know, we're definitely looking at that. On the packaging of um, securities and selling it, I mean, those are securities, so that, wouldn't be DFS specifically, but we have the regulation of the lenders, and if they're not appropriately licensed and they're not, you know, doing loans appropriately, we can stop that activity, which then prevents the packaging. And the other side of it is, and and we're looking at this carefully, is in our regulation of the banking institutions, we look at their investments, and if they are investing in some of these packaged uh, uh, items, you know, so larger institutions or even an insurance company, um, you know, we can look at that because that also creates a risk. I mean, what happened in the financial crisis was the interrelationship between all of those uh, things and the heavy concentration in, um, you know, certain investments such that when the real estate market dropped, there was all of that interconnectedness and the same thing could happen. So you shouldn't have a large percentage of your portfolio, for example, in this type of an investment. Just like you shouldn't have an overwhelming part of your portfolio in certain types of other loans, right? It's just so it's part of the oversight, but it's not admittedly complete because the securities piece of it would be the Securities and Exchange Commission or what I previously did in the AG's office, 
um, the Investor Protection Bureau and the AG's office on the security piece of it. Senator, while you mentioned the lack of banks and mortgage uh, and the lack of financial institutions to Correct. the NDA, and that's why the uh, Google Tech Task Forces, what can the EFS do to enhance banking for urban and rural areas? People do have options. Rather than going to pay the lenders, So, um, on the credit unions, um, we we have too few state credit unions, in my view. We should have more of those, those credit unions, um, and we can certainly uh, work with them and encourage them uh, to come to those uh, to those neighborhoods. As I said before. Uh, the business development districts, or as I look at this further, might there be some other legislative way to address some of these things? There needs to be an incentive, um, for the most part, for a banking institution to go into an area where, you know, they might not feel that they're getting a, a sufficient profit, and that's where the municipal deposits are a place where we're, right, municipal deposits is, is something that um, would encourage uh, them to come because they can get $10 million, maybe $15 million, they can get $5 million from the city on some of these, and, and that's, you know, low dollar, um, low cost for them, so that's a good uh, incentive for them. There may be others. I also think, and maybe this is optimistic thinking, but if we at DFS work well with our community banks, you know, they're doing well, a little bit of encouragement, why don't you open up a branch here? And, and these branches do not have to be a large piece of real estate. Right. So the costs don't have to be that large. Electronic everything, you could have one employee in a very small square footage spot in the neighborhood and a lot of electronic banking anyway. I mean, that's where banking is going anyway, so it shouldn't really be a very large cost. Uh, to do that, so I, I would like to, um, you know, encourage, and, and I've already s talked to, to some, try to convince them to do it. Which neighborhoods will we'll work on? Brownsville is uh, uh, an important place. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Thanks for my question. I really appreciate it. I look forward to working with you. Thank you. Great job. question and the concerns behind it. Uh, the I, in, in a resolution of improper activity, I can certainly require restitution, but that usually is the individual victims. I think what you're, you're speaking about is this sort of larger fines, and at DFS, any penalties or fines that we levy and collect 
go to the state budget i don't have authority over that i'm not asking for that authority i'm just stating that that you know and that might be an avenue but i can tell you that if under my watch i see predatory inappropriate you know practices we will go after them and do what we can in our legal mandate to get the money back to the people who are suffering uh, but i may not have the full authority uh, to then basically allocate to a broader community uh, again i think that um, might be a legislative or a budgetary question i hope that answers the question it's certainly an answer okay predatory lending mm -hmm. um, what have we put in place to prevent the next uh, I, I see them, the market trying to get back into uh, the same practices that created the problem in 2008. Uh, I was the chair of economic development for the city of New York uh, at the time uh, at the city council level. And at the time, I proposed the strongest anti predatory lending law in the nation. Uh, in 2002, I saw this coming. The banks, of course, took me to the court, the federal court. No attorney. I told the banks then, you're going to rue the day that you did this. And I wish I were wrong. But what are we putting in place to ensure that this doesn't happen? Again, I don't, I don't believe that we have enough, even in New York State, uh, safeguards to ensure that we're not going to be here again. Um, I. I think we're doing a lot and we'll continue to do a lot at DFS on the predatory lending uh, issue. As I said, we are going after any of these lenders, all of these online lenders, payday lenders. They are popping up all over the country and they're trying to lend to New Yorkers. A lot of this is being done online and we are watching it. We sent out, I think, about 25 letters a few weeks ago to a number of them saying, tell us why you don't, you're not required to have a license. Uh, and because we believe if you're lending, you need to have a license. And, and then, of course, when we get the data from them, we may learn that there are usurious and other improper practices. So we are vigilant on this. We are watching what we see nationwide and looking at all of these companies. It's it's not an easy task, but it's a doable task. Um, people are popping up, and the internet, frankly, allows a lot of this. And they can just, you can, from your home, create this business and then populate a website that makes it look like the American dream, and it's not. Uh, and so we are going after that. And as I said, uh, certainly on the mortgage banking side, because we, we supervise mortgage banking and mortgage servicers at DFS. And we are very vigilant there, uh, you know, in terms of the mortgage servicing and, and bank, you know, new mortgage banking practices. On the, again, on the, the other banking side, looking at the investments and making sure that this crisis in a new format doesn't happen again. So it won't be housing. It'll be auto lending. Auto lending is probably the third, uh, automobile cost is probably, you know, the second or the third highest household cost. Uh, and so when you're, when, and many people need the car, they need it to go to work. And so, but when, when the car is $10,000, but they're actually paying $25,000 and actually can't make the monthly payments, uh, and when some of the lenders have these devices on the car where, you know, if you don't make a payment, the car stops. I mean, these types of practices are obviously predatory, but more so you shouldn't pay that high of an interest rate for a car. And you shouldn't have the GPS added onto it at a much higher rate, which effectively is a usurious interest rate because the actual charge should be lower, but they make the charge higher to make it not look like usury. So we're looking at that and, and um, we'll be very aggressive uh, in stopping those type of practices as much as we can. Um, enforcement of the CRA mm -hmm. and uh, in the Sandy communities, we're getting hit with insurance gouging, insurance uh, duties practices 
uh, enforcement of CRA, and tell me about, so I say, since I'm on insurance, I deal with the insurance question. Okay. Maybe, Thank uh, you, Senator Sanders, because we're running out of time. CRA. CRA. <laughs> CRA. So we, we have uh, our Consumer uh, Bureau, our Financial Frauds and Consumer Protection Bureau is on the CRA. We look at that, we examine institutions for that, and we ensure compliance with that as well as, you know, fair lending laws. Uh, and we work with, you know, all of the consumer groups uh, to be, to make sure that we are uh, doing what we're required to do and more on that. So, so this is a we're, we're back to back with the insurance committee, and they would be coming in, especially at 1030, to interview her. So we need to move this along quickly. So Senator Parker? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be quick. Uh, I'll be quick. First of all, thank you for having being here. Of course. Another, another uh, program resume. I know. Thank you for reaching out. I appreciate it. Sure. Um, you have a very, very impressive resume, and although you were kind of shying away from being a sheriff of Wall Street, you certainly have the credentials. Um, okay. Maybe not a sheriff, maybe a marshal. Mm -hmm. Well, but you're well prepared uh, mm -hmm. to, to deal with any wrong mm -hmm. um, I just really, uh, I just really want to go on record. Um, well, the other things I'm going to say, we, we shared a building for some time, actually, with the world's paying record. Uh, ah, they were a building, 1285. Ah, that's great. Yeah, uh -huh. so, uh, there for a long time. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, I have some concerns that, that some of my other colleagues have um, as it relates to. Uh, the lack of financial services in uncertain yeah. communities. And certainly, mm -hmm. just one of the members, you on the record, say that uh, as a member of this committee and as a member of also the insurance committee, certainly looking forward to working with you to try to solve some of these issues. Um, we'd love it if you would think about supporting a municipal policy bill that we try to get past here several times. Um, I carried it for a number of years uh, and, and we just get it done. Uh, and and but I think that would certainly help. Um, some of the existing is both that that is credit for the savings and loans that certainly under the uncertain years. Um, and, and also that it would not even cost anything to the large commercial banks who are reaping all the benefit of it right now. So certainly you could use um, the might of, of, uh, of the department to do that. So I just wanted to be right about that. Sure, and I'd be happy to work with you and look at that. I think the the issue with the municipal deposits and credit unions is that um, uh, credit unions have tax advantages that other financial institutions don't, and then that's where yeah, but it's so small. It's not so small that it's really nothing. It important. shouldn't and have. It really should, should not be holding up. Right, but I, I I understand. I'd be happy to work with you on that, Senator. Thanks, Senator Murphy. Yes, first of all, it's very nice to put a face with the name. Yes, I've got to tell you, on the record, being proactive, reaching out to members here yep. was an excellent, excellent okay. idea. Thank you open up the communications, and I love you working with them. Quick question about Zombie Property Street. Is mm -hmm. there any plan in place with regards to condominiums, townhouses, co-ops, with people that just walk away and the, uh, the, the, the maintenance fees that, uh, in, in my case, we have an area up where I live where there's a lot of condominiums and things like that. So uh, in one particular case, there's an elderly gentleman that um, actually had to uh, take out reverse mortgage just to pay his neighbors, age wages. Uh, do we have any plan in place or is there something that we would be able to do with regards to expediting these particular cases and making sure that these people that don't walk away from their houses can actually stay in their houses? What, uh, the co-op piece of it, I mean, only, yeah. we would only regulate right, the mortgage part of that. So it's so, happening, so I own a condominium. Right. I walk away from it. This person right here. So it's a one, a one right family here. condominium, basically. Yeah, okay. correct. But it's in a cluster. Mm -hmm. And so I have, we all have maintenance fees of $200, sure. $300 a month. Mm -hmm. Now, Senator Parker has fees. to pay my maintenance fees. This is a big problem for, in, in my district. Right. I can talk to you off the record later. No, I'd be happy to talk. I mean, I've been, I've been focused on the vacant and abandoned properties issue and which has a number of different components. One is obviously the maintenance of the properties, uh, right, right. and you know that's yes. a big part of it. The other is expediting the foreclosure process because all of these costs, and who pays those costs, and I, and I hear right. you in the condominium or co-op situation, the other members are then picking up those costs. 
and I understand that there's bills that are, you know, pending before the legislature more broadly on this. Uh, quite honestly, I haven't focused on the condominium co-op piece of it, but it's something uh, certainly to look at. I think it would, it could fall within the overall question of having an expedited foreclosure process and having some obligation during that foreclosure process for the maintenance and what you're saying, not just maintenance, but the payment of fees. I mean, I, th I think it's the payment of taxes, so why not also the payment of the co-op fees, yeah. which probably include that's, taxes that's too. Exactly right. So. I hear you. you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Murphy. Uh, we want to thank you for your uh, willingness to be candid on your opinions on the myriad issues before this committee. Uh, in your comments, you may not have realized, but you, you offered support for just about every bill that's before today, <laughs> which is positive. We like that. Um, you're going to be coming before the insurance committee yes. immediately after this. We do have some bills that we have to take up, but um, I am very happy to be able to move your nomination forward onto the insurance committee, and from there we'll be going to be going to the finance committee, and I have no doubt you will be confirmed by the full Senate and be the superintendent of insurance by the full board meeting. And this week, if not next week, uh, we look forward to working with you. Same here. Uh, I'm excited about your, your work and what you're going to be doing with us, and congratulations to Maria Rulo and to her family. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.